All right, thanks for watching. And today we would like to talk about metric spaces, which are a very useful and powerful generalization of the real numbers and of absolute values. Because if you remember absolute values, there was one identity that we used over and over and over again in this course, which is what? Exactly, it's the triangle inequality, which simply says that the absolute value of x plus y is less than or equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. And from that, we deduce a nice corollary which simply says that the distance between A and C is less than or equal to the distance between A and B and the distance between B and C. And we interpreted this as saying that uh, the length of the leg of one triangle is less than or equal to the sum of the other two legs. Of course we use this a lot, but there were other properties which we unconsciously used without even thinking about it. Namely, first of all, the distance between x and y, it's always non-negative, so hopefully that is clear. Moreover, the only way the distance between x and y is zero is if the two points are the same to start with. Also, the distance between x and y is the same thing as the distance between y and x. And lastly, of course, the triangle inequality, which is just saying that the distance between x and z is less than or equal to the distance between x and y and the distance between y and z. Now, what's the idea behind a metric space? Suppose uh, we forget everything about the real numbers, like in the matrix, except for those four properties. It turns out uh, the stuff that we get, which is called a metric space, isn't so different from the real numbers after all, which really shows that those four properties are really the essence of the real numbers. So now, without further ado, let me define a metric space. So, definition, let S be any set. Then we say SD, so not San Diego, but uh, the set S with a distance function D is a metric space if the following four conditions hold, and don't be shocked, those are pretty much the same as the beginning. Namely, the distance between two points is always non-negative. The only way the distance between x and y is zero is if the two points are the same to start with. And the distance between x and y, it's the same thing as the distance between y and x. And last but not least, the distance between x and z, it's less than or equal to the distance between x and y plus the distance between y and z. All right, and seems like a weird definition, but similar to before. And really to show you how powerful this is, let me give you 10 examples of metric spaces that occur in nature. Okay, so some very important examples that you'll see throughout this course, and um, except maybe the last two, they are a bit exotic, but so. Again, metric space, any set with a distance function that satisfies the following properties. Well, of course, the first example is the one we've seen before. So the, the real numbers with the distance simply being distance between x and y is the absolute value of y minus x. And then, well, there are other metrics on uh, uh, metric spaces like that, but to get more interesting examples and more natural examples, let's go one dimension higher. So consider, and don't laugh, but R2 with the metric D2, 
So literally R two D two, where. <laughs> Where the distance between two points, and I apologize for this notation, but it's the one that the book is using. So the distance between x1 and x2, and y1, y2, is just the following. It's just the usual distance. So this is d2. So d2 between x1, x2, and y1, y2, and again, sometimes I'll mix them up, so just my apologies. It's just the square root of the sum of squares. So y1 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus x2 squared. Again, just the usual distance, so for instance, d2 of uh, 1, 2, and then 3, 4, it's just the square root of uh, 3 minus 1 squared plus 4 minus 2 squared. I believe it's square root of 8. And by the way, we'll use this distance function so much that I think from now on we'll just call it d. So just know d is this distance. But there's a reason I write 2 to distinguish it from other d's. Um, and of course, this can be generalized to higher dimensions. So note, in general, what we can have, we just have the distance between x1 up to xk and y1 up to yk. It's again just the square root of the sum of squares. Square root, if you want, of y1 minus x1 squared plus uh, yk minus xk squared. And with this distance, in fact, rk and d is a metric space. In fact, we can generalize the previous thing to, uh, well, Rn, or the book calls it Rk. So note, there's also Rk and d, where the distance between x1 up to xk and y1 up to yk is just the square root of the sum of squares. So y1 minus x1 squared plus yk minus xk squared. Okay, so that is one possible metric or metric space for R2, but there's other ones that are even more interesting. So consider the following one. So R2 and D1, and I'll explain in a second what this is, but D1 will sometimes be called the taxicab metric for reasons that will be apparent in a second. So let's take X1, X2, and Y1, Y2, then d1, all that it will be, it will be the uh, sum of the distances of each leg. So d1 will be this plus this. In other words, to make this more formal, uh, d1 of x1, x2, and y1, y2, will just be the sum of the absolute values. So y1 minus x1, plus uh, y2 minus x2. In other words, you take this, this distance, which is y1 minus x1, and you add it to this distance, which is y2 minus x2. Now, why is it called the taxicab metric or the Manhattan metric? Because if you want to get from this destination to this destination uh, with a taxi in Manhattan, Usually there's a building in the middle, so you can't just cross this. This is not Grand Theft Auto or anything. Uh, so what you do, you first go one block to the right and then one block up and you go to your destination. So that's usually how your taxi fare is calculated, at least back in my days. Okay. <laughs> 
I think things have changed. And also similarly, there is something called the infinity metric. Okay. So R2 and then D infinity, which simply is as follows. So D infinity of X1, X2, Y1, Y2, it's just as follows. So it also has to do with legs of triangles. So suppose this is X1, X2 and then y1, y2. Now, again, consider the legs of the triangles, and all that this infinity thing is saying, it says, take the bigger leg. Okay? So in other words, it's the bigger one, or the maximum, of those two distances. So, um, what was it? Uh, y1 minus x1, and y2 minus x2. So in other words, this is one in this case, it's the infinity distance between the two points. I don't know what it's useful for, but just to show you there are other exotic metrics on R2 or on RK. But of course, not everything is a real number or RK, so let's do some more uh, exotic examples of, of metric spaces. So now let's consider S to be the set of all bounded sequences. You'll see why he's bounded. Uh, it says Sn. So for instance, the question is how could we define the distance between Sn and Tn? Well, consider the following. So suppose this is your sequence Tn, and this is your sequence Sn. One doesn't have to be uh, smaller than the other one, but just for illustrative purposes. And what you do is for every n, you look at the distance between Sn and Tn, and we just define the distance to be the biggest possible spread between the two sequences. In other words, take the maximum of Sn minus Tn, where n is in n. So again, the furthest away the sequence could be. That's what the distance is. And just be a little bit careful. So you might be tempted to say that the distance between Sn and Tn, it's simply the square root of the sum of squares. Square root from n from 1 to infinity of let's say Tn or Sn minus Tn squared. But the problem is this doesn't always work because it turns out sometimes this becomes infinity. If you take the sequence Sn to be zero and the sequence Tn to be always one, then it turns out this blows up. And we do not want our sequences to blow up. We, want, we do not want our um, distances to go to infinity. We want them to be finite. So that wouldn't really work. All right, so we have that for sequences, and then, well, we will talk about functions in chapter three, but just to give a little taste, um, so that S be just the continuous functions on the interval A comma B, then it turns out you can have something quite similar. So if this is A and this is B, and let's say this is the function f, and this is the function g. Then also look at the biggest possible spread between f and g. So look at f of x minus g of x, but the biggest possible value of that. So then we can define the distance f and g to be just the maximum, so the biggest possible spread of, if you want, f of x minus g of x, where x is in your interval. It'll take some work to show that there is a maximum value, but it turns out uh, this is true. Um, and not only that, we can even spice this up a little bit more because now consider the same thing. So example seven, 
Again, same space, but this time, the distance between two functions is the following, and you might even love it or hate it, we'll see. So this is A and B, let's say this is F, and then this is G. Then the distance is just the area between those two things. I know it looks like a, <laughs> um, a cat candy or something, you go boom, boom. And then what this is, it's just the integral from A to B of F of X minus G of X dx. That's also distance between two functions, namely just the area between the two. And we can even spice up this example. And the next one is actually very useful because instead of just considering the integral or the area between the two, consider square root of the integral from a to b of f of x minus g of x squared. I know it looks very weird. Why am I doing this right now? Because this arises a lot in applications, especially it's like the, you'll see in later math courses, this is the most natural distance. And why is this the most natural one? Because remember an integral is just a sum. So you're really taking the square root of the sum of squares. So it's really the generalization of R2D2, if you'd like. Okay, and last but not least, just two very uh, exotic examples that you won't really see much, at least in this course. You can even define distances between two sets. So if you have two sets A and B, then the distance between the two is just the smallest possible diff distance between two points. So in other words, it's just the infimum of let's say, let's say in the real numbers of the absolute value of a minus b, where a is in a and b is in b. So think of two people on two different continents trying to communicate. Then a is trying to go as close to b as possible. And that is really the smallest possible distance. And, uh, but it turns out this distance is very bad because you see, even though the sets are very far apart, that infimum might be very small. And last but not least, so a very strange metric, but still really cool. That's what's called the discrete metric. So take R and D, but then D is very weird. So it says either the point is the same, so zero if X equals Y, or everything is one apart. In other words, everything is a distance of one apart. And it's kind of weird. It's really the, the social distancing metric in some way. It's like everyone from you is just one away. Which is, again, not a very natural thing to consider because technically points are usually closer than other ones. But this is really saying every point is one apart. And by the way, this is an excellent source of counterexamples. So definitely remember this for counterexamples. But again, uh, I, even though this seems unnatural, there is a more natural way of picturing this. Take, let's say, one, two, three with the same metric. Then that space is just the equilateral triangle with vertices one, two, three. Because you see here, really, it is true that every point is exactly one apart. So now we've seen lots of examples of metric spaces and therefore really understand that everything that we'll show from now on will hold true for all 10 examples all at once. So we're literally killing 10 birds. No, we're killing 10 birds and... So really understand, okay, that everything we'll prove from now on will be true for those 10 examples. So in other words, we're really killing 10 birds with the same stone. Imagine that. All right, thank you very much.